So thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I'm head of business development for QCWare, um, and um, we'll be discussing um, some of the latest uh, work that we've been doing in uh, uh, various quantum algorithms, many of which are applicable in, um, in for finance use cases. So let me start real quickly by essentially comparing and contrasting what we do on the software and algorithmic side versus what um, hardware vendors are doing, right? So uh, these days you hear a lot about hardware vendors. They're a lot in the news with uh, uh, announcements and um, they are basically uh, producing different chips and every new announcement talks about more qubits and better quality qubits, right? Which is great. I mean, this is exactly what we need. Uh, but there's actually a very um, important um, second part really to this equation to, um, uh, to what the hardware manufacturers are offering. And this is the algorithmic side, right? So we on the QCWare side basically are trying to get to the same place as hardware manufacturers, uh, like practical quantum computing. That's, that's where everybody's trying to get to. Uh, but essentially we come at it from the software and algorithmic side. And so every time we um, uh, announce something, it's about essentially announcing a new algorithm that solves the same problem as before, but with fewer qubits now and uh, or delivers better performance, right? An algorithm that delivers uh, better performance than that was previously possible. Um, and obviously, these things, there's still a gap um, uh, between these things, right? So the, yes, we get more and more qubits from the hardware manufacturers, and we on the algorithmic side and other companies on the algorithmic side are essentially reducing the number of qubits required to run practical applications, but these things haven't really met in the middle, right? And so we're going to be discussing basically kind of the movements in this um, uh, presentation on what has been happening on the algorithmic side and especially some some of the um, uh, areas where basically QCWare has uh, has made some some inroads and some um, groundbreaking um, new discoveries. So uh, the way we're going to do this is by uh, essentially plotting the different algorithms as bullet points on this graph. So the x-axis of this graph has um, essentially the quantum hardware progress where we expect hardware is going to be in the next three to five or five to 10, 10 to 20 or 10, 20 plus years. And on the y-axis, we're going to be looking where at where um, um, the speed up, uh, whether the, the, the specific algorithm is really providing a speed up or it's not providing a speed up, right? Um, and this is whether we can prove actually, so um, yeah, whether we can prove that the algorithm provides a speed up, right? So there are some algorithms where we don't really know, and that's why there's a tier there called unknown in the bottom. We can't really know whether uh, it's gonna provide a speed up. We can't really prove it. It has to be kind of empirical. We have to try it and, and see what happens. Um, and then kind of the moderate tier kind of roughly coincides with uh, polynomial speed ups than the, um, uh, and the high tier um, kind of roughly corresponds with exponential speed ups, right? And uh, just to level set, uh, I'm gonna take two algorithms that a lot of people are talking about. They're not um, specific to finance. So, uh, so the one is this VQE algorithm that's gonna be used for, for chemistry simulations. Uh, it is a heuristic, that's why it kind of belongs into this unknown uh, tier, but um, uh, pretty much everybody's expecting it will make a difference. It will um, be possible to solve uh, for uh, real life use cases in the next three to five years based on where quant uh, quantum hardware will be in the next three to five years, right? Because it's uh, it can deal with noise. It's not very deep in many cases. Uh, there's a lot of work that has been been done on it, so uh, it kind of it's a, it's a good um, uh, candidate to be placed in that uh, bottom left box. So the top right box on the other side, we would have something like prime factoring, where uh, it delivers an exponential advantage on uh, compared to what is known today, but we're still uh, um, several decades away from being able to actually run something like prime factoring on a real um, quantum hardware. The circuit depths are, are really, really um, uh, deep and really long, and we require qubits of, of really, really high quality in order to be able to run something like prime factoring. On, on a real uh, quantum computer, right? That's why it belongs in that top right uh, corner. Um, 
But in this presentation, we're going to uh, concentrate basically on machine learning, optimization, and Monte Carlo simulation, and we're going to see how this landscape has moved, right? So um, uh, again, I think it's easier to track how the hardware landscape has moved. I mean, you, all you have to do is kind of open up the press releases for the major players, and you can see when they announced their you know, two qubit or five qubit machine or their 50 qubit machine. Uh, for the algorithms, it's kind of harder to track that. So that's exactly what we're going to be trying to do that um, here on this graph. And we're going to basically just go maybe uh, three to four years back, maybe five, and see how these bullet points are basically moving um, and um, how things are, are changing uh, in this landscape. Okay, so let's start with uh, quantum machine learning. Um, so if we look at um, where we were maybe three, four, five years ago, um, we have uh, essentially one uh, set of papers, one set of algorithms that deal with quantum neural nets. Uh, quantum neural nets are great. Uh, we expect them to be great, just like uh, classical neural nets. Uh, however, they're uh, empirical in nature, just like classical neural nets. You really have to try them out and see if they work. Uh, you can't really uh, prove anything. And that's why we put them in this lower tier uh, that really says the, the speed up or the benefit is really unknown at this stage. Time. We can't really make a, a statement. Um, and we have them uh, on this uh, five to 10 uh, year uh, bucket just because, uh, you know, five years ago or in general, we, we expect to um, uh, need uh, maybe a few hundred qubits, maybe a thousand, maybe a couple of thousand qubits to actually um, produce a quantum neural net that can actually uh, solve real practical application, right? Uh, so that's why kind of they fall in that box or, or back then three to five years ago, they, they fell in, in that box. Um, now, the other thing that was developed uh, over the last few years were different um, quantum machine learning techniques. And there were, there were a few that were answering some very significant problems like recommendation systems, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, clustering, and classification. And really, when, when these were introduced, they, uh, I think um, uh, no one would, would uh, argue with this. They would really fall into this 20-plus year uh, bucket. And there isn't really a very specific reason why they would fall uh, so far away, basically. Uh, and they would really require uh, quantum computers that are very, very mature. And uh, the reason for this is of this thing, because of this thing called QRAM. Basically, all of these papers that introduce all of these algorithms kind of made this QRAM assumption. Assuming you have QRAM, this is what the reinforcement algorithm looks like, or this is what the recommendation systems algorithm looks like, and so on and so forth. So you might be asking, okay, well, what is QRAM exactly? Um, well, the simplest way to explain it is that it's simply just a mechanism really to load classical data into quantum states. And you might be thinking, well, that's pretty basic, right? And that's pretty fundamental. And it really is. I mean, it really was um, a big elephant or a gorilla or, uh, uh, or pick your favorite analogy in the room. The fact that you couldn't really um, effectively and efficiently uh, load uh, your classical data, so, so real number vectors, right, into a quantum state and then access them during your algorithm in order to basically do clustering or do classification. Really, there was no efficient way of doing that. Um, and um, um, obviously, that didn't actually deter many people. I mean, they still basically wrote these papers and actually that was, I think that was the right thing to do, um, where basically they were saying, well, assume you have this QRAM um, and uh, this is what we can do uh, with that. Uh, but that actually, that's what actually pushed basically all these uh, algorithms to the far right uh, hand side of, of the graph we showed earlier. Um, however, earlier this year, uh, QCWare uh, introduced this data loader concept, which basically is able now to do this loading of uh, real numbers, um, uh, vectors of real numbers into the quantum states in a much, much more efficient way. And then for those uh, states to be available for the execution of the algorithm. So with that, um, we have uh, sort of the QNNs kind of moving to the left. I mean, things will move to the left as time progresses, right? Uh, if we got it right the first time, right? If we got the, uh, if we got the, um, um, the bucket uh, right the first time, the characterization of an algorithm, it, it will slowly uh, move to the left. That's where we wanted to go. Uh, so we're now closer basically to running uh, quantum neural nets, real quantum neural nets for real problems, right? 
Um, but the biggest impact has been basically uh, with uh, the data loader because now basically we're saying, well, this thing that we thought it was 20 or, or more years away because we really nobody really understood it or nobody really had an efficient way of doing it, uh, we're now actually much closer, right? So, uh, you know, classifiers, clustering, reinforcement learning. Obviously, there's different levels of difficulty, right, with this, all these QML approaches. So, um, uh, so classifiers fires are easier, clustering is a little bit harder, reinforcement learning is, is harder uh, than that. So, but all of them have moved significantly to the left because of this, um, uh, this data loader introduction. And just wanted to highlight that um, uh, we got one thing wrong when we initially talked about recommendation systems. We thought it was going to be an exponential speed up. In the end, our uh, essentially classical um, uh, colleagues uh, uh, kind of um, uh, checked uh, that and said, well, maybe not so fast. Let's kind of really take a hard look at this. And, you know, there were some other results that uh, got introduced and basically recommenders, the performance of recommenders has kind of been downgraded a little bit. It's still pretty fast and, and can deliver significant improvement over classical approaches, but uh, maybe not quite exponential, right? Um, so this is the more detailed slide, and actually I will be um, sharing these slides uh, on uh, on my Twitter feed and, and LinkedIn. Uh, this is the more detailed slide of basically how, how uh, many uh, qubits are required and what's the circuit that's required to actually uh, run this uh, 40 by 25 black and white image. Uh, so you can see the bottom row there is the new result and the previous rows are basically the old results. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is kind of the detailed one. If you look at the, um, um, uh, if you look at it in terms of uh, kind of a more visual way of looking at this is that basically uh, here's where we are today with classical ML, right? We can, we can process 160,000 pixels, no problem. Uh, here's where we are with the QML plus data loaders. We can do maybe a thousand pixels. And here's where we were before the data loader with uh, QRAM. I mean, basically we can only do a hundred pixels. Um, obviously that's not to say that QML is only about image processing. There are many, many other applications where maybe you don't have that high dimensionality as you have for the images um, and you can still basically get to um, uh, to real practical results uh, sooner rather than than later right uh, so let's look at uh, Monte Carlo uh, so Monte Carlo um, is obviously one of these algorithms for finance that has uh, very um, very special meaning and it's very um, it's critical it's going to be critical for for several use cases like pricing of derivatives um, value at risk calculation. And there is an algorithm, right? So there's already an algorithm that uh, provides a speed up over the classical um, um, algorithm. However, the, um, that algorithm requires really high depth, right? And really deep quantum circuits and demands very low noise rates. So that's kind of the same way of, of saying the same thing, right? Uh, so it really uh, requires this full scale um, error correction. Uh, which would put it basically 10 plus years away. And what we're introducing now, uh, so the QCWare team is basically introducing the sallow MC algorithm that essentially requires less depth and can deal with more noise. And it's so maybe uh, five to 10 years away as opposed to 10 plus years away. Uh, but there's also a little bit more to the story. Let me show you the picture. So if we were to go back to 2015, um, this is what the standard uh, quantum Monte Carlo look where it was, would have been placed. Uh, now um, in 2019, we had some new results. So it got pushed a little bit to the left. And now with the shallow MC algorithm, basically what we're saying is that um, we can actually push it to the left a lot more uh, while trading off some performance, right? That's why that bullet point is actually um, kind of lower uh, in the um, in that y axis, right? So uh, effectively, we can yeah trade off some performance, but make this more more NISC, right? So that's the um, uh, that's where we are with Monte Carlo. Again, uh, I'm providing this kind of more uh, detailed set of results here, uh, which shows that you know what. Um, would be required to run um, kind of a simple derivative calculation. So you would need 100 qubits. And even with um, this best result right now, this uh, NISC or shallow Monte Carlo algorithm, you would still require uh, qubit um, error rates of 10 to the minus 5 
whereas the current error rates are really 10 to the minus two or 10 to the minus three, right? So, um, and, you know, things get obviously progressively harder if you go to complex derivatives or you go to highly complex derivatives, right? Um, but you can see here the improvement that has been, that has been made. So, so it's important to note that, you know, we need to keep working at these problems, right? And yes, currently, we're not close to where we want to be to have practical applications, but uh, there's a huge progress that has been made um, over over the last uh, over the years, right? Um, so uh, the last class of problem I'll talk about are optimization problems. Uh, so there are several different approaches here that uh, are relevant uh, for finance. Uh, so obviously we uh, we have the annealers, um, and the quantum annealers are actually great. They um, uh, they are becoming larger and larger. Um, uh, I mean, they're kind of a healthy way of um, approaching these. Um, um, these problems. Um, however, I mean, it's just because of the nature of optimization of certain optimization problems, you can't really make statements that say that annealers will definitely beat uh, a certain other approach, uh, just because you can't really make kind of these statements for some very hard combinatorial optimization problems like the NP complete problems. Um, uh, all of these approaches are really heuristics. So you basically, you have to try it and empirically basically say whether, you know, this um, annealing approach is working for you or it doesn't. Um, but there's definitely been significant um, um, progress. And we would say that even, you know, back in 2015, what the, which is the snapshot that this slide is showing, it was definitely one of the best um, uh, or more near term solutions that uh, we had in store. Um, the other kind of very interesting algorithm was this QAOA algorithm that was um, run on gate-based architectures. And um, uh, it was proven to actually uh, provide a speed up for certain classes of problems. Uh, so, and it was also uh, pretty resilient to noise. So it was also thought to be um, sort of this kind of near to meet term algorithm that we could use in the near to meet term, right? Um, and then there's, there were several other things that were basically linear uh, optimization uh, optimizers or convex optimizers, and these relied on linear algebra and um, were significantly further away, right? Just, just because they required some, some of this linear algebra to actually take place on a quantum computer and therefore required really um, um, deep uh, circuits. Uh, and Grover search, uh, same thing. It can provide a speed up, uh, but... Um, it requires really deep circuits, right? So if we move uh, just a couple of years, then things kind of naturally move to the left. Uh, but one actually big development was that um, um, several people realized basically that you can get kind of the Grover speed up without uh, using some of the deep circuits there. So that um, uh, bullet point moved significantly to the left. Um, where we are today is that uh, things keep moving to the left, which is great. I mean, that's exactly where we want uh, things to go. Uh, however, there's been a development with QAOA in the sense that uh, we don't, um, uh, it's been proven now that it's actually not going to deliver uh, better than classical performance. Uh, if you listen to the uh, inventor of QAOA, Eddie Farhi, the way he says it is that a uh, bunch of uh, classical computer scientists ganked up on him. Uh, it kind of sounds like uh, they took him out of a bar and kind of pulled him out in the alley. But um, uh, I don't know exactly how it happened, but it was proven by, by classical experts, really, that uh, QAOA actually doesn't have this advantage over classical approaches. So it has been demoted, and we now think we will require more qubits and better quality qubits to actually um, use QAOA. And uh, this QAOA plus is basically just, or plus plus is just basically um, a small improvement from, from the QCWare team, right? But um, um, it has, it has kind of our, our approach and our expectations for QAOA has, uh, have dramatically kind of changed over the last uh, three, four years. Um, and, and the other uh, approaches, the deep quantum heuristics keep improving. The convex optimizers will also benefit from the data loader because it's basically linear algebra and, and that benefits, uh, the data loader will benefit uh, anything that has to do with linear algebra. Um, so I'm sure all of you will be asking, okay, well, where, where can I read about this? Where are the papers on this? And, um, and the answer is, uh, the answer is uh, they're coming very soon. So we actually have three papers that are coming. The first one, uh, which should be uh, up on the archive in the next couple of weeks, 
uh, is a review paper on um, quantum algorithms in finance, a deep technical review. Uh, it's called Prospects and Challenges of Quantum Finance. Uh, it's written by the QCWare team. And there uh, we discuss basically all of these algorithms that, uh, that I described on, uh, on the slides here in a very, very high level. Obviously, in the review paper, there are um, uh, proofs that, that show basically uh, the, um, um, the results that um, uh, lead us basically to, to, to put these algorithms, to characterize these algorithms as either near term or long term or, or moderate in speed up or or high in speed up and so on and so forth. Um, we do have a paper with, for the data loaders that is coming out. We've actually implemented this with a hardware uh, partner and we're going to be essentially are, uh, writing the paper right now. So um, we're showing how the data loader works in practice on hardware um, and uh, that should come out in the next uh, month or two. And then the same for uh, Shallow Monte Carlo. We're working there with an industry partner that and where we show basically the results of uh, and the proof that this uh, Monte Carlo uh, algorithm can work uh, much better than um, the previous ones. And that one, th this paper is probably um, two, maybe um, uh, maybe two and a half months uh, away from actually being published. Uh, and with that, I'll just say um, a last word on our Q2B conference. If you're not familiar with it, Q2B uh, is the longest running conference. We started back in 2017. It runs every year in December. Obviously, this year it's going to be a virtual event. Um, uh, it, uh, it's specifically uh, targeting uh, quantum computing. And it has been really drawing the largest crowds. Um, uh, it combines uh, sort of a business perspective, technical, government, industry, academia. We have an amazing speaker lineup for uh, this year. And um, uh, if you are not familiar with it, uh, go check it out at q2bconference.com. If you're familiar with it, go check out the program. We have the program already, uh, about two thirds of the program already released uh, with some great sessions. So please um, uh, take a look and, uh, and join us if you can. Thank you.